I'm Bob Chidlaw. I write DSP code for Source Audio. Well, it was a strange path, and um, I wouldn't really perhaps recommend it. Um, when I was a kid, I really loved mathematics, and I wanted to be a math major. When I got to college, I took a special freshman calculus course meant for math majors. And wow, I didn't like that at all. It was just far too rigorous and not really interesting to me. So um, then I decided, what else could I major in? Well, I really liked physics, so I got a physics degree. And then I spent a year in physics grad school and finally decided, you know, this really isn't very good either. And then I just had to get a job, and I'd already done some programming, so so I found a, a programming job and uh, doing a lot of uh, what was then sort of called numerical analysis or scientific programming. Uh, for a company, did a lot of work in photography and optics, and I learned an awful lot there. And then I got a chance to work for uh, Kurzweil Music Systems, making Kurzweil synthesizers, and. That sounded like an even better thing, because I was already an amateur musician. In addition to being the DSP department, I was also the soundware department at one point. So I had to run off to recording studios, and you know, we'd bring back analog tapes and play them back into our A to D converter, which cost $25,000, <laughs> and, and was mono, <laughs> and also didn't sound very good. Things progressed. Uh, in the 20 years that I was there. Uh, and I started working for Source Audio. No, I, I first I started working for analog devices. I, I consulted for analog devices for two years. And then when uh, Roger and Jesse uh, decided to leave analog devices and start a guitar paddle company, um, I was the natural person that, you know, they asked if I wanted to do that, and so certainly I did. Well, step one is to decide what kind of reverb you want. Um, what, what is its special feature, its special sound? Uh, what distinguishes it? The Ventress reverb had um, a bunch of different reverbs. Of course, the classic hall sound is, is sort of what Lexicon called their hall, and it indeed seems to be an appropriate name. Um, and there, there have been published uh, literature on just what those algorithms look like. And um, so we sort of knew how to do that. Yeah. And, um, but then there is a certain amount of fine tuning uh, that has to be done. And also, of course, every time you're writing a new algorithm, if something doesn't sound right, there's a question of, well, did I just make a mistake in, in uh, programming it? Um, or is my idea of how something should be done, is that, is that just wrong and it doesn't really work? And you've got to sort those things out. I mean, usually the, the programming mistakes are, are really pretty obvious because the, the most common output from a from some blunder like that is like full-scale screaming sine waves at, at three kilohertz, right where your ear is the most sensitive. But you know, in order to do something new, something you, ha you haven't done before, you've got to take some chances, and it's possible that what you think is going to work won't. But um, that's actually pretty rare. I guess that's partly my, my skill at uh, knowing what's going to work. I mean, the idea that you can achieve an intuitive feel uh, for playing around with numbers, uh, that might just seem like a very, very foreign idea to people, but, but I like numbers. Um, I often prefer them to people. <laughs> I do have some intuition on what's going to work. Um, 
But some of it was painful. Like at at, uh, at Kurzweil, when first started working with uh, resonant filters, um, I didn't really know how much how much resolution we needed. How many bits did we really need? And um, so I just did the experiments. I tried it, more and more bits, and said, well, that sounds better. And then eventually got to the point where I was looking at spectra to to look for artifacts because. I couldn't really trust my ears. A spectra, uh, it, amplitude versus frequency. It's like, it looks like a frequency response, uh, except if you just put a sine wave in, you, all you expect is a sine, if, for, for many algorithms, say it's just a sine wave out, and you don't want anything else. And, um, but you can, see, you can see junk in a spectrum that's um, down 150 decibels, mm -hmm. and yeah, you're not going to hear that. But if you if you make a change and you see, well, that went from from 150 decibel signal to noise to 140, it's like, whoa, we're not going in the right direction here, are we? There's what's the problem? And so, figuring out how to do these things, um, I did that a long time ago, and so now that's sort of old hat. At a certain point, you've got to start thinking about, okay, how do we control this? What are the controls we're going to be giving to the user? And what controls are going to stay hidden? Uh, some, you know, something that I can set internally, but we're not going to present that to the user because it's just too many controls. You know, and then you've then you got to say, well, all right, do these controls give you the full range of sounds out of the reverb that, that I know this reverb can do? Um, if you want it to sound like a, a much smaller room, you can't have really long delay lines in it. That's that seems pretty obvious. But if the delays if the delays get too short, then you haven't really got enough total delay time in the reverb algorithm, and that doesn't sound very good. So you've got to constantly be listening to these things and trying to evaluate things. And is this good? Is it bad? Is it controllable? And then you've also got to know when to stop when you've reached the point of diminishing returns. Say, this is probably as good as I can get. I've used up 98% of the instructions because once we finally get the thing running, we almost certainly find, oh gosh, we need this little thing. We need, a, we need to give the users another control to do such and such, and that's going to take a few more instructions. And then we have to start stripping stuff out and I don't, I don't like this remove code that I've already added. Yeah, other than the ease of, of making changes without the aid of a soldering iron, um, DSP is less noisy if it's done right. The converters have to be absolutely top-notch. Um, even though you think, oh, it's just a guitar. It's a high-impedance instrument. Uh, it's by virtue of its high impedance, there's a certain amount of noise. And all this is true. But nonetheless, you just really can't add any noise. And then when you're processing, you have to know, if you, you have to know how many bits to keep in order to preserve the signal-to-noise ratio. And, and you have to be aware of the sampling rate that you need. For instance, in the Kingmaker Aftershock uh, distortion pedals, some of the distortion is processed at a sampling rate of 192 kilohertz uh, internally. Uh, because we just, it sounds better if you do that. If it's too high, you're wasting effort. But, if, but a higher rate, though, will give better performance. I've actually done a lot of analog work. Um, I think far more than than most people who are who are doing DSP. My first projects used vacuum tubes. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I I built I built an AM radio. It was from a kit when I was um, in when I was like twelve or something, uh, and that was that was pretty exciting. It was pretty cool. Um, so I've actually worked with vacuum tubes, and then I've worked a lot with uh, analog stuff, with op amps. Um, 
I built two analog synthesizers. One, uh, a modular synth. It had like four oscillators and I think two filters and maybe four ADSRs and the... Uh, and then I built a polyphonic synth. Not a lot of people have built homebrew polyphonic synths. Um, so there was a lot of analog work there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's nice not to have the noise problems. I mean, so I see some things in analog as being similar to digital. When I, when I put in a high-pass filter as a, as a DC blocker, um, you always have capacitors generally coupling stages of, of analog processing. And there's always a capacitor on the input and the output of every box. And, and we do that too, and it's the same, the same reason. But I can do a two-pole high pass, and it's really easy, and I get a better frequency response. Whereas a two-pole high pass in analog is starting to be a lot of parts. And unless they're really, really good parts, a lot of noise. And if they're really good parts, then only a little noise. But you've always got that noise problem coming in. Now, the, the C4 pitch detector, I looked at an analog pitch detector before I started on that. But I've gone way beyond what an analog pitch detector could possibly do. There's a lot of serious decision making uh, the processor is, is doing. And um, there's no way you could do that in analog. <laughs> spring reverb algorithm from the true spring just because yeah it's just this coiled up wire and some some really crude uh, transducers to to vibrate the spring and to listen to the spring um, those transducers are really very much like the elements in dynamic microphones um, so it's again yeah very 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 old technology but that doesn't mean that it can easily be done digitally. Back when I was doing image processing, it was really easy to point to something on a screen and say, see that? See how it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bright edge from a, a dark area to a light area. We call that an edge. You say, now, if you look into the, into the dark area, you can see little echoes of the bright area appearing. And uh, it's easy to point to that and say, see, the filter is ringing. It's ringing. It's, a, it's image processing, but it filters like in image processing can ring, too. So you can just point to it and say, see, it's ringing right there. And I remember many times at Kurzweil, I would sit with someone else and we'd be playing a sound back and I'd be trying to say, right there. <laughs> As the sound is going by, I say, right now. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> so trying to point to, to things in the sound are, are difficult. It's sometimes it's very hard to, to listen to something and hear it. And in fact, it took all my coding cleverness to to jam this in there it was a it was an obsessiveness was required uh -huh. it's like I'm gonna make this thing fit and it's gonna be as good sounding as it possibly can be you want it to be able to, to work as a musical instrument it's, it's got to be something you can play and really uh, not have it getting in your way it's just got to feel natural mm -hmm. um, since I, I play guitar and I'm well enough to amuse myself with it um, after, after 50 years, I feel I'm starting to get good. Um, so I, I do enjoy playing guitar. And so I have to be able to enjoy playing guitar through the effects that I write. If, if, it's, if it's not fun, there's something wrong. New 
new sounds. Yes, that's that. That's a hard problem to come up with new sounds. Yeah. Um, yeah right. I remember on the Ventures, the, the the offspring algorithm. When I first heard that, it was it was an accident. I mean, it was an experiment to find the worst sounding reverb, and it was just so amazing the sound. It was like, all right, well this this wasn't what we were looking for at all, but. But yeah, we're going to do this. Um, so that's that's just the fortuitous discovery, yeah. uh, and you have to be ready for that. Yeah. But then to think about, just plan something out, and that's that's really totally new. That that's a really hard problem. Yeah. It's like if you're writing a new song. I guess you can, you know, the song is right there, and you can play it on the guitar, and you can sing it, and Okay, uh, yeah, well, that's done, you know. But if, if I'm going to try something new and really different, I'm going to have to write that algorithm yeah. before, I can, before I can hear it. And um, I can imagine what things are going to sound like, but it, if it's really that different, I don't know, right? If you do something too different, um, then, of course, you run the risk of nobody liking it. Now, I've done weird synthesizer space music before, and uh, some of my friends and I have, have done stuff that I, I really was quite proud of, you know? And I'm, So I hand out some CDs, because this was some time ago, back when one still handed out CDs. And I got really so few positive responses back from my friends! Of course, the music it's just too different from, from anything you've heard unless you're really particularly into to that genre. Uh -huh. um, I remember one comment was, there's two parts going to this and, and, they're, and they're unsynchronized and they're not in the same key. Yes, is that a problem? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if I come up with something that that's really, really strange in the effects world. Well, no one's going to want to buy that pedal. 21st century. The cost of processing will continue to fall. I think that's a pretty safe prediction. And we will be able to do more and more stuff, in, even in something as simple as a little guitar pedal. Um, you know, at a certain point, um, certain point, all the reverbs in all the reverb pedals out there, they all will sound pretty good. Because, uh, I mean, it's more than just, of course, the processor power. You have to sort of know what the algorithms are, and you have to, sort of either by experimenting or just reading the literature. You know, when Dave Griesinger uh, from Lexicon developed the Lexicon al reverb algorithms, he did that when it was so difficult to do any sort of digital audio processing, let alone something that sounded as good as his reverb algorithms. And I believe he also did that before there was a theoretical underpinning for the nature of the reverb algorithms. Uh, the theory that was out there when he did his algorithms, uh, it, it, just, it didn't really cover his algorithms. He really, he really came up with something quite, quite unique, I believe. Uh, I'm sure he did it independently, if anyone. And, uh, and it sounded so good, you know. At some point in the future, provided someone has made a, a digital model of a germanium transistor, but it'll be possible to um, essentially take a schematic and put that into the computer yeah. and it will produce code that simulates the schematic. And you don't have to really think too much about anything. You just have to put in that schematic. And, and it will just, and it converts the schematic to a, a system of partial differential equations that you can then numerically solve. Uh -huh. The processing power to do that <laughs> is immense. Um, you, you have, instead of running at 48 kilohertz, you probably have to run more like at one megahertz. Yeah. 
and the and the stuff in between, the, the the stuff that you do for every one of those clocks, uh, instead of a simple bunch of instructions, it's a whole bunch of instructions that have to be done iteratively. You have to do them. You have to just keep churning through them. When you're finally done, you say, "Okay, I'm done," and now we'll go on to the next, the next millionth of a second mm -hmm. that comes in. Um, I'm going to be retired before that gets to be feasible to put in a guitar pedal.